Hey everybody, I'm Taylor Sparks. Welcome again to my class on materials informatics. Now today for today's video, we're gonna talk about what exactly is materials informatics? Why should we care about it? Why are we doing this class in the first place? So to answer that question, we need to dive into what is the heart of material science and the core, you've seen this before, you're familiar with the tetrahedron probably, right? Material science is all about the study and investigation of these structure, property, processing relationships, right? That if you know uh, what property you want to get a certain performance, well then you know how you need to process the material to get that structure, right? How these things are all tied together. Understanding these linkages is the core component of material science and engineering. So with that said, um, some of these relationships we've learned over the years and they're relatively simple. For example, how about hall patch, right? You've probably seen hall patch relationship in your introductory material science course. It showed something like hardness or strength as a function of grain size. In fact, they usually do grain size to the negative one half power because they found through empirical relationships that as you reduce the grain size, things get stronger and harder, right? So to the right, these would be smaller grain sizes since it's to the negative one half power. But that only reaches to a certain point. And after that point, basically you lose your benefit, right? But this relationship, this sort of um, hall patch relationship has been a really important hallmark of material science and engineering. Um, so that said, why do we need data science to do that if we can do that on our own, right? Well, data science allows us to do this with much more complicated relationships. Instead of these really simple ones where it's just grain size, for example, it's playing a relationship, maybe it's many different relationships and maybe it's not a linear relationship. Maybe it's nonlinear and complex, right? Those are things that are gonna be really hard for us to capture with our human intellect but those are things that we can capture quite easily through data science, right? So let's take a, consider a few examples, right? Uh, data science is already doing some amazing things, right? If you're like me and you follow machine learning in the news, you'll see that there are crazy headlines constantly popping up. Take a look at this one, right? It says, a new artificial intelligence can guess whether or not you are gay or straight from your photograph. How crazy is this? So the idea was this. You took uh, dating websites, which have people's faces, right? And then it has their sexual preference. And so now all of a sudden you can build a classification algorithm, which takes the face as an input. It does the machine learning magic, which we'll talk about this semester. And out comes a prediction that they're straight or gay or, you know, whatever they're predicting. So in this initial study, they found that it was 91% accurate. Imagine this has crazy ethical concerns, right? Um, now, there have been some follow-up studies, right? So Stanford, Wang, Kaczynski did a follow-up, and they found that it's actually 81 to 85% accurate for males and a little bit less for females, 70 to 71% accurate. Um, and then what's interesting, they started realizing, well, it's not as if they're like recognizing that, you know, cheeks or eyes or freckles or whatever lead to this being one or the other, but rather these algorithms were really good at catching differences in the way that we present ourselves. So for example, the way that we have our facial hair, mustaches or beard, or you know, the way that we do our eyebrows or the way that we put makeup on or earrings, right? It was paying attention to those things in much the same way that humans do, but doing it in a really quite accurate way, far outperforming human people. So here's one example of capturing really what ought to be complex trends from data and doing it quite accurately. But what about materials, right? Um, this is a really cool one. This happened just last November, right? So when I was a kid in high school, there were these softwares that you could download. They were screensavers. <laughs> back then, screensavers were a thing that I don't think anybody has those nowadays. But back then, if you let your screen sit, uh, there were concerns that it would damage it because we use different technology than what we're currently using. And it basically if you had the same image on your screen for too long, it would be damaging. So instead, you change the image periodically. And one way that they came up with was to do protein folding with your computer. What a clever idea, right? Because protein folding, figuring out these big complex protein molecules, they can come together, they have all these different functional groups that can interact, you know, bonding and light, you know, strong versus weak bonding all over the place. It's really hard to predict the actual structure that these things will have. And so they had this really clever idea. They said, all right, there's all these computers across the world being used sometimes, but mostly sitting there with screensavers running. What if instead of running a screensaver, you had a special screensaver that was actually gonna be doing the protein folding simulations? And so this is a way to farm out the calculation of this, what seemed this impossibly hard problem to lots and lots of people. So that was one approach, you know, and they've tried lots of things over the years. As this uh, headline says here, uh, Alpha Fold, this is a solution to a 50 year old grand challenge in biology. So this is something that's been worked on for a long time. And lo and behold, um, AlphaFold 
has now come up with a solution to this. Uh, the company's deep mind that came up with the solution to this using, you guessed it, uh, machine learning, right? So here's a quote from one of the founders. He said, we'd been stuck on this one problem, how do proteins fold up for nearly 50 years? And then to see deep mind produce a solution for this, having personally worked on this problem for so long and after so many starts and stops, wondering if we would ever get there, this is a very special moment, right? Pretty incredible how accurate it was able to make these predictions using machine learning. Rather than using explicit calculations of all the bonding interactions, it just used machine learning to make these predictions and solve this incredible problem, right? So that's, that's getting closer to material science, right? Proteins, let's get a little bit closer still. If you're like me and you love 3D printing, you can see one going in my background over here. Um, 3D printing is so rad, um, and yet you realize maybe that 3D printing is actually a little bit tricky and it doesn't always give you exactly what you're looking for. For example, when you're 3D printing metal alloys in whatever technique you're using, um, you'll realize that many times you start with these really fine nanoparticles, but when you do the actual uh, densification and, and printing of them, they become prone to what's called hot cracking, right? So this degrades the mechanical properties. You get cracks forming during the solidification of the 3D printed metals. It's just not great. Um, however, we have come up with a solution to this. The first ever 3D printable aluminum alloy was developed by a team and the team used, a, so it was based out of HRL. That was where the lead uh, researchers came from. That's formerly Hughes Research Laboratories, uh, as in Howard Hughes, the airplane manufacturer. Anyways, it's gone through some changes. Now it's HRL Laboratories. Um, and I love this. Uh, one of the researchers, Brennan Yahada, says, we went from a haystack to a handful of possible needles, right? Because finding the exact composition was like finding a needle in a haystack. There's so many different alloy compositions to pick from. How are you going to know which one will give you the properties of interest, right? The idea here is that you can use machine learning to help you down select from the enormous number to a small number of reasonable possible needles, like it says here, right? So what they did is they actually used this um, they partnered with Citrine, a great company who's actually shirt I'm repping today. They're the ones who got me involved in materials informatics many years ago. Um, they combined classical nucleation theory, so theory about material science with some best, uh, some rules on lattice spacing, with some thermodynamic stability, with density, materials informatics. And what they were ultimately able to do is search through over 11 million combinations of powders and nanoparticles to end up at the one that is now the very first 3D printable aluminum alloy. It's actually been, it's got its own grade, right? You have to register it with the aluminum, I forget the organization, but it is now aluminum 7A77, which is a 3D printable aluminum alloy. So more and more case studies like this, which are just remarkable achievements are being made possible by artificial intelligence, machine learning, materials informatics, right? So where did this all start from? It's only a couple decades old. That's what's remarkable, right? Um, I mean, there were other fields that were using uh, big data and machine learning long before material science. Material science is late to the game. It really got kicked off in the early 2000s. One, for example, one of the big first articles that came out was from Krishna Rajan in 2005, a Materials Today article, where he laid out some of the framework of what this could potentially achieve. What is this new paradigm? What will it require? What could it potentially do for us? This was a, it's a good article. It's worth reading. Um, Krishna Rajan is, is a forward thinker. In fact, he actually, at the time, he was at Iowa State, I think, when he wrote this, but he left and went to University of Buffalo and founded a new material science department. I think it's called Materials Design and Innovation. And it's centered on materials informatics, right? Everything they do is infused with data science put into the material science program. So uh, this was one of the early pioneers in this area. Um, but I would say that in the early days of materials informatics, it was pretty rough. There's a, a psychology professor at, I think he's at Duke, who I just love a lot of things he has to say. He had this tweet back in 2013. He says, big data is like teenage sex. Everyone's talking about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. And so everyone claims that they are doing it. And that was definitely the case with materials informatics in the early days. Uh, and I'm no exception, right? When I think of some of the work that I was doing early on, we got onto this trend of wanting to look at uh, big data really early on. We were in 2012 when we started doing this. And uh, what we were doing, what we thought was big data, was really just writing very analytical review papers, right? Something that was really great is we were using uh, data from literature to assemble these large databases, and then we were able to generate these sort of websites that would allow you to visualize data in really unique ways. Let me show you an example of one. So for example, right here, you can see on this website, which is still uh, open and running, you can check it out, 
uh, if you go to, you, you know, you can select your different parameters, you know, whatever you want to plot against one another on the X and the Y, you can select what you want the marker size to scale with, and then you can generate these plots and you can even sort your data in different ways. And in the end, you're able to generate really cool bird's eye view plots of different fields and you could hover over the point. If you clicked on it, it would take you to the article where we took the data from, which is pretty exciting, right? So this was a cool way to, I'd say, visualize and organize data but there's no artificial intelligence here. There's no, there's, there's very limited data science to this. So I'd say that it was a good first showing, but there's a lot more that could be done. And so in the years that followed, we really got much more into understanding what data science can do for us. And that's important because as a field, we need to just take a look at this, right? Why do we need material science, materials informatics? Just take a look at this, right? This is showing the number of publications by keyword as a function of years. Now, this is a log scale on the y-axis. So this is, you know, log linear plotting. And take a look at battery, magnetism, crystal growth, thermoelectrics, polymorphism, metal organic frameworks. All of these are basically linear in this plot, which means that it's actually exponential growth. And just ask yourself, how many, you know, and I guarantee that your field looks very similar. There are, there's this explosion of research happening right now. And what are you doing with all of that data? Are you are you actually reading 10,000 papers a year? Because that's about how many are being published in most of these fields of material science right now. And if you're not reading 10,000 papers a year, which you're not, if you're like me, you're reading maybe a couple hundred, maybe a thousand if you're going nuts, you're skimming, then what are we doing with all that information? A lot of work and effort went into generating that data. Are we just gonna toss it out? That seems crazy, right? No, we need to take advantage of it. And to take advantage of it, we need to rely on computers to help us because it's just intractable right now. It's way too much data for us to handle on our own, right? Now, here's another problem. Just throwing more and more researchers at a problem, hiring more scientists, making more universities, hiring you know, more research institutes, isn't necessarily going to fix our problem. Take a look at this example from the field of thermoelectrics, which is near and dear to my heart, right? So the, the figure of merit ZT is the one that really scares with, scales with efficiency. And yet take a look at this. Over time, ZT had this sort of like roof of like one for many decades. And then in the early 2000s, we started to eventually break above it. Um, but on average, as more and more researchers got into it, the average ZT from the data that we collected was actually going slightly down. It was a slightly negative trend. So just because you got more and more researchers involved didn't necessarily mean that you solved the problem because most of the time the breakthroughs were the exception to the rules. It was something unexpected. It was unusual. And we need a way to go about rationally designing new materials to allow this to happen without relying on the you know happenstance breakthrough, right? Here's another one. We can use uh, there is a ton of useful information embedded in large data sets, and you don't necessarily need domain knowledge to extract it. Here's a great example, right? So if, if you're like me and you love science fiction, I grew up and Star Trek was on TV, although I was a, I was a Star Trek, the next generation guy myself growing up. Um, but they had these devices. They'd go to these alien planets, and all of a sudden they could just be talking with one another. And, you know, how's that work? There's no way that English is the language of the galaxy that's silly so instead they had what seemed kind of like this equally silly object a little object that was their universal decoder they could talk into and they would just hear lang the language being uh, translated in real time so that was the science fiction dream and then came along reality which were these little handheld devices which were atrocious you'd sort of like slowly type in the text and then it would translate it but it would get it way wrong it would miss context it would have you know it didn't know what to do with homonyms and different meanings it was just problematic and then nowadays, we have incredible things like Google Translate, where now with the Google earbuds, I don't know if you've tried these out, but while you're wearing them, you can have it switch into translate mode and it will translate in real time. So if somebody's speaking French to you, you will hear English, right? Which is incredible. We're getting closer and closer to the science fiction dream of uh, machine translation being just universal. Now, why do I bring this example up? The reason I like it because in the early days of this, they relied on domain knowledge. They hired linguists. They hired grammar experts and said, all right, if you want to translate this phrase to this phrase in this other language, here's all the grammar rules that you need to follow. And they were basically doing it by hand. They would programmatically come up with the steps to do it. And then there's this uh, pioneer in the field of natural language processing. His name is Frederick Jelinek, right? He died in 2010 this Czech American researcher, fascinating guy. He has this often quoted statement, which I'm gonna tell you today, which was that when he was working on uh, natural language processing, trying to make this process work better, he once said the following, he said, every time that I fire a linguist, the performance of the speech recognizer goes up. 
So in other words, when you fire somebody with domain knowledge and just take them out and instead replace them with a data scientist, a statistician, you can do better. You don't necessarily need domain knowledge, especially when you have lots and lots of examples. At some point, you can just learn from those examples without knowing the reasons behind them, right? So um, can we do the same thing with material science? That was the premise behind the so-called Materials Genome Initiative. And it's fitting that I talk about this today because it is June 2021. And exactly 10 years ago, June 2011, we had the Materials Genome Initiative for Global Competitive come out. This came from the Obama White House. And the idea behind it, it came from actually from a study at the National Science and Technology Council, I think. Um, they had this thought that, you know, there's all this data and other fields are really benefiting from using it. Could we do the same thing in material science? Or in other words, is there a materials gene, right, that we could identify, just like we have human genes that gives me freckles, right, and, uh, you know, blue eyes. Is there the same thing that allows you to do the same thing but for materials that leads to high strength or to ductility, right? That was the idea behind this. So they kicked it around. They came up with some ideas. And one of the main goals it had, which we will often hear repeated, is that it was going to help us develop new materials twice as fast at a fraction of the cost, right? Which would be amazing because right now we develop materials, you're probably aware of this, it's a decades long process. It is just painfully long. So we wanna do much better and that's gonna require um, a couple of things. First off, one point of materials uh, genome initiatives was, was we're going to equip the next generation workforce. We're gonna train new students through things like YouTube videos on materials informatics with the tools that they need to do materials informatics, right? Second is we're going to enable a new paradigm shift in materials development. I'll show that in the next slide. Third, we're going to integrate experiments, computation, and theory in a way like we've never done before. And finally, we're going to facilitate access to materials data. These were the premises behind the Materials Genome Initiative, which would feasibly help us discover materials much faster. So what exactly is this paradigm shift? Well, take a look here. On the, on the left, you're seeing the traditional approach, which shows how materials are discovered, which basically you start with publications, you look in the literature, and you basically find a system of interest. You say, like, oh, they're, they discovered such and such in this material. And then you think to yourself, well, what if we swapped out this atom for that one, or we changed the microstructure or the grain size or whatever it is that material scientists do. We come up with our design of experiments. We synthesize, we characterize our materials. We get some sort of performance or property. We publish it and we just repeat. And this goes over and over. But what this leads to is um, I would call it local optimization, meaning systems that get studied get really studied. A bunch of people dogpile on those because it's very unlikely for you to pick something totally out of a hat because the odds of success are pretty low. Now let's shift gears and compare that with a data science or materials informatics approach. We're still going to start with literature, but now from this literature, we're going to apply data mining. We're going to extract relevant information from those studies in the literature. We're going to create a database or possibly a user website. We're going to create machine learning algorithms to help explore new chemistries. From those, we can actually generate systems that create, for example, recommended candidate rankings, right? Which now gives us a ranked list of interesting candidates. We could then screen those using sustainability or chemical intuition or feasibility of synthesis or whatever you want. We still have to make our experiment where we're going to make these things, fabricate them, measure their properties, measure their performance, and then publish them. But because this becomes a loop and we start with these much better list of candidates, the odds of you getting uh, successful you know, outcomes is much higher, which is exactly what we're after in materials informatics. This is the way that we're going to dramatically accelerate materials discovery. So obviously in the you know last few decades, there's been this surge of interest. It went from being less than 10 articles per year to now being hundreds of articles a year uh, using my Scopus keyword for materials informatics. And I'm sure if you used other keywords like machine learning, there'd be even more. And yet it grows and it's growing and it's growing. So the question is, is materials informatics a passing fad or is it here to stay? Are you taking this class with, you know, um, is it going to be worth your while in five years or will it not be? Because take a look at the Google trends for machine learning in the bottom panel. The trend rose and in 20, what, 18 or 19, it peaked and now it's actually declining as for whatever reason, less interest, maybe people don't, they, they're not buying into the hype as much, but who knows? Is that gonna be the case with materials informatics in the same way? Are we gonna see it peak as well? Let's see, why might it peak? Well, there's a company called Gartner and I love it. They put out this Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies every year. And new technology, as it comes on board, they say that most technologies fit along this curve where things have this innovation trigger and then you have this peak of inflated expectations and then you have this drop to the trough of disillusionment where you realize, you know, it got, it, they said it was going to do all the things for us and it's actually hard and it doesn't work very well. 
And then you get the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. I mean, think of like voice to text, right? I remember talking to Siri in the early days was like, whoa, it's going to do what? It's going to schedule your hair appointments for you, all this stuff. And then in reality, you're like, oh, this isn't great. And then over time, we talk to Google and Siri and Alexa and all of these things all the time now. It's definitely reached the plateau of productivity. Well, in any case, five years ago, machine learning was the top of this chart. They said it was going to do all the things for us. Machine learning was going to... You know, we wouldn't even need scientists in the laboratory. We just have robots and machine learning. And I think in the years that followed, we definitely saw it reach its uh, trough of disillusionment while we realized, ah, this isn't working quite as well as we thought. But have we reached the plateau of productivity? It predicted for the general machine learning in two to five years we'd get there. Is that the case for material science? I'd say yes. Um, certainly seen some great examples. And I'm going to show you many more over the course of this semester. But that doesn't mean that we're done. For example, this was five years ago, the Gartner hype cycle. Remember, it said in two to five years it would reach the plateau of productivity. Well, what, where is it at now then? Are we just there? If you look at the emerging uh, technologies for last year, I don't have it for this, this year yet, take a look at where machine learning and AI is now, right? You've got explainable AI. You've got embedded AI. You have responsible AI, AI augmented development, generative AI, composite AI, adaptive machine learning, and on and on and on, right? Two-way brain, uh, two brain machine interference. So many cool things are coming on board. So uh, I think what's happening is that we're realizing that the basic vanilla um, impl application of machine learning to material science uh, can do great things, but it's also limited. But there's so much more that we can do with it. And so that's why I think it's worthwhile for you to take a course like this to continue to expand what we can do and what we will be able to do with data science applied to materials research. So in our next video, I'm going to jump into this big question of how are materials actually discovered, right? Because I think that's an important uh, thing to compare how we're going to be doing it versus how it's been done in the past. So look forward to seeing you in the next video.